Hi, I will now read a paper or an article that summarizes my work on HIV transmission and spread, anogenital anatomy and the risk of sexual HIV transmission. My name is Bastian Fischer and I summarize the work of the paper in the abstract. HIV AIDS affects persons from sub-Saharan Africa and men who have sex with men in a disproportionate way. This article analyzes the evidence and the theoretical plausibility of anogenital anatomical factors which may contribute to the HIV-AIDS pandemic in the high-risk groups for sexual transmission, the so-called key populations. The following factors which have been offered to explain the HIV pandemic are discussed. Concurrent relationships, sexual risk behavior among MSM, socioeconomic factors, intravaginal practices, sexual violence, small sexual networks, biological factors, and combinations of these factors as well as further factors. Analysis reveals that these factors have low explanatory power for reasons of lacking consensus within the scientific community or of lacking global coherence and uniformity. It also reveals that sub-Saharan African ethnicity and the practice of anal intercourse are both factors which may point to the exact causal factor for HIV spread. Direct evidence for narrow anogenital anatomy in HIV high-risk groups is presented, which involves inter-ethnic comparisons of vaginal shape and introital caliber, as well as measurements of the anal caliber. Direct evidence is scarce but positive and may serve as an important piece in the HIV spread puzzle. Indirect evidence for narrow anatomy in the sense of abductive reasoning is plenty and involves the prevalence, I'll say what that is, abductive reasoning is plenty and involves the prevalence of anodyspareunia in MSM, uh, trouble during intercourse in MSM, of coital anogenital bleeding in MSM in South Africans and of maternal death in African Americans, the elevated risk of sexually transmitted infections associated with the use of sex drugs and lubricants, concurrent relationships, secondary abstinence, bacterial vaginosis, dry sex, as well as two anomalies in the HIV infection dynamics of Kenyan female sex workers. Two semi-theoretical arguments that I significantly improved for the anatomical hypothesis are put forward. In the versions in which I gave them in other videos, uh, they contain some minor flaws, uh, which I corrected now. Two semi-theoretical arguments for the anatomical hypothesis are put forward. N narrow anogenital anatomy is then analyzed in view of Hill's criteria for causation. Hill's criteria for causation are criteria in, in medicine or in epidemiology that distinguish uh, mere correlations from associations that are possibly or quite plausibly causes of things that they are related to. I describe how randomized controlled trials or other confirmatory studies could be designed in order to test the theory and mention the consequences of its possible truth. Finally, some political objections to my hypothesis are evaluated. I won't read this part as I already uh, read that part in a, in, a, in a separate video, so I will skip this part and I'll read the rest of the paper. In conclusion, most non-biological and biological factors which have been put forward in order to explain the HIV-AIDS pandemic lack plausibility. Direct and indirect empirical evidence militates for a central role of narrow anogenital anatomy in HIV high-risk groups. Semi-theoretical arguments are in favor of such anatomical factors which fulfill all the Bradford Hill criteria, these criteria distinguishing cause from mere correlation. The theory can be tested both in non-interventional studies and in randomized controlled trials. It may significantly reduce the HIV spread and political hurdles to the theory are either flawed or vincible, as I discuss in that separate video. Now the paper itself. Introduction. HIV AIDS affects persons from sub-Saharan Africa and men who have sex with men, MSM is the abbreviation that I will use in the, in the following text also. 
uh, HIV AIDS affects persons from sub-Saharan Africa and men who have sex with men in a disproportionate way. At the end of 2010, African Americans made up the largest percentage, 44% of those diagnosed with HIV in the USA, although they make up only 12.6% of the country's population. Similarly, Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 69% of all people living with HIV, while housing only 12% of the world population, source 3. Likewise, the rate of HIV infection among MSM in capital cities is on average 13 times higher than in the general population. This article analyzes the evidence and the theoretical plausibility of anogenital anatomical factors which may contribute to the HIV-AIDS pandemic in the high-risk groups in the key populations for sexual transmission. These key populations that I just named, African Americans, uh, Sub-Saharan Africans and MSM. Uh, African Americans that may include people in the Caribbean and uh, this may also include people who uh, who migrated from Africa very early in human history. They might suffer from the same problems. At first I will discuss the plausibility of some different factors. This is the method of the paper. I said it would be a systematical discussion. I also hope that I won't uh, digress too much as is my custom. Now, at first I will discuss the plausibility of some different factors which have been considered as an explanation of HIV's disproportionate spread. Then I will put forward the direct and indirect evidence for narrow anogenital anatomy, NAA, in the high-risk groups. I will consider two semi-theoretical arguments for anatomical factors and analyze whether these fulfill Hill's criteria of causality. I will describe how randomized controlled trials or other confirmatory studies could be designed in order to test the theory and will mention con the consequences of its possible truth. Finally, some political objections to my hypothesis will be critically evaluated. Again, see uh, the separate video for this part. Now, the discussion. Low explanatory power of behavioral, socioeconomic and, be and many biological factors. The exact etiology of the HIV-AIDS pandemic remains poorly understood, source 4. And this is not some weird source, this is one of the main uh, high-impact HIV-AIDS journals that this article is from, and it was written by a former editor of that journal. The exact etiology of the HIV-AIDS pandemic, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, remains poorly understood. We don't know what causes this generalized epidemic in the heterosexual population. Currently, multiple factors are held responsible for the disproportionate HIV spread in each of the high-risk groups. Elevated promiscuity, predominantly in the form of concurrent relationships, is a contributing factor, source 5, but its explanatory power for the enormous pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa continues to be an issue of debate, sources 6 to 8. Again, these sources are from high-impact journals. Comprehensive review articles, two of them by Larry Sowers, or whatever the pronunciation of his name may be, and in the uh, Journal of the International AIDS Society, one of the, one of the first or leading HIV-AIDS journals, he reviews all the evidence that there is for uh, concurrent relationships as 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 contributing factors or as possible causes of the HIV AIDS pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa and he has to conclude that the evidence is limited for this um, factor as causing the H HIV AIDS pandemic. In the USA, sexual risk behavior fails to explain the difference in HIV prevalence between white and black MSM, sources 9 and 10. Instead, biological factors somehow related to anal intercourse seem to play a central role in HIV transmission among MSM worldwide, 11. And this is a Lancet study, a Lancet review article that was done by Chris Byra and colleagues. He is now the uh, the president of the International AIDS Society. It was a Lancet review article, the comprehensive review article that found or where they found that biological factors are uh, may, are responsible for the bulk of HIV transmissions among MSM globally. 
promiscuity or sexual behavior has been vastly overestimated in MSM HIV epidemiology. They state, I wrote it down here, from this, from these review articles or from this Lancet series by Chris Byra, it follows that if the biological risk that is somehow related to anal intercourse, if that were reduced or could be reduced in MSM, there would be um, an 80 to 90 or even 98 percent reduction of new HIV AIDS infections in men who have sex with men. Theoretically, they calculated if consistent condom use uh, in, in casual sex, if people consistently used condoms in, in, in uh, casual sex, a, new HIV infections in MSM would go down by 30 to 50 percent, would be reduced by, th by 30 to 50 percent. But the biological risk factor, the biological risk of anal of receptive anal intercourse, if that were could be reduced, then new HIV infections would go down by 80 to 90 percent or more. And any sane epidemiologist would conclude from this, from this fact, that this is the way to go. We need to address the biological risk factor. We need to address this one in order to conquer, in order to conquer this, this spread. Because what they also concluded is that in MSM, as opposed to the, to the epidemic or the pandemic in heterosexual key populations, uh, the numbers, the new infection numbers are still rising everywhere. The MSM pandemic is still on the rise everywhere in the world, whereas in heterosexual key populations or high-risk populations, numbers are stable or uh, rather go even, even go down. But the MSM pandemic of HIV is out of control. So something must be done now. But this is almost a fact now. This follows from this from this uh, comprehensive Lancet review article. Biological factors are responsible for the bulk of, of HIV transmissions, and sexual behavior has been vastly overestimated, which which has also been shown in this study that pitted black MSN, MSM against white MSM. And there it turned out that uh, black MSM who used less drugs, protected themselves more, and were less promiscuous that they had higher infection rates than white MSM who used more drugs, were more promiscuous, uh, and protected themselves less. And globally, even globally, it turned out in their meta-analysis of data from around the globe that the MSM pandemic is driven by this biological risk associated with anal intercourse, with receptive anal intercourse. This is the culprit in MSM. And in order to conquer the spread, in order to control the epidemic, the pandemic, uh, it is clear that we have to address this biological risk factor and prevent it. Yet ethnicity is an independent risk factor regardless of sexual orientation. Being black remains the strongest risk factor for HIV acquisition in South Africa, even after controlling for various socioeconomic variables. So it's not the poverty, sources 12 to 15. Also comprehensive articles in major HIV AIDS journals, not some marginal thing, not something written by AIDS denialists, not something written by weirdos or charlatans. The same holds true in the USA, where increasing income seems to protect all ethnic groups from sexually transmitted infections, but where ethnic identity remains significantly associated with the diagnosis of an STI after adjusting for socioeconomic covariates. I can also refer to this other fact or to this other study, the poverty study, international poverty study from, from Oxford or in Oxford Poverty Index, where it turned out that HIV low prevalence countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, were actually poorer than India or than many parts of India, but that high risk countries in sub-Saharan or high prevalence countries, HIV high prevalence countries in sub-Saharan Africa, like Malawi, South Africa, that they are actually richer than India or that at least some of them are much richer than India, but still they have very high infection rates, whereas in India they are quite low in terms of prevalence, not in terms of total numbers, but in terms of prevalence in India, the epidemic is not 
so bad as people feared it would be because they saw that they already saw that the socio-economic in conditions in India were sim were quite actually quite similar to sub-Saharan Africa and everyone feared that in India soon we would have a similar pandemic of HIV as in sub-Saharan Africa because people thought it's the socio-economic conditions but <laughs> in India no pandemic, uh, at least not one as bad as in sub-Saharan Africa, developed. Part of this disparity now may be explained by differences in sexual behavior, since concurrency itself was found to be closely tied to ethnicity in a recent review of six large sexual behavior surveys in South Africa. Concurrency in men was 7 to 16 times higher in blacks than in whites, while colored men, so-called colored men, this is a kind of a differentiation in South Africa, it's not, it's not my word, while colored men had rates of concurrency between those of whites and blacks, reflecting their intermediate HIV prevalence. In women, however, concurrency was significantly associated with being black in only one survey. The mean number of men's sexual partners within the last 12 months, however, was in the range of uh, 0.91 to 1.42 for all ethnic groups, with a maximum difference between blacks and whites of no more than 0.33. So again, mean number of men's sexual partners within the last 12 months, 0.91 to 1.42 for all ethnic groups. And this, this mean had a, these means had a maximum dif had a maximum difference between blacks and whites of no more than 0.33. So blacks, on average, have 0.33 uh, partners more per 12 months or in the last 12 months. So even if a great proportion of HIV transmissions are due to concurrent relationships, this is what uh, one researcher replied to this to this source article where he claimed that concurrent relationships cannot be responsible for the pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa. He said, well, yes, but our calculations say uh, concurrent relationships, well, well, if there are transmissions, well, about 80% of transmissions or even more are due to concurrency, to concurrent relationships. They don't take place in steady relationships, but they come from outside, from concurrent partners. Uh, but even if a great proportion, even if that if that is so, that may be very well true. But even if a great proportion of HIV transmissions are due to concurrent relationships, it seems somewhat implausible that this form of non-monogamy alone directly and precisely explains the, the South African epidemic, given the relatively low chance of per-partner transmission and the very low chance of per-sexual act transmission found in studies on serodiscord and heterosexual couples with a mainly uh, non-African ethnic background. Yeah, in that study, 89% of, of the participants had a non-African ethnic background. The study that I quote here is rather old, I have to admit. I, I should refer to, to new studies, to recent studies, but here I consciously or intentionally refer to, a, to an older study because it's from a time when HIV medication, when, when uh, antiretrovirals were not used so much or were not, more, were not as good as, as they are today. And so the viral load was maybe not, not suppressed too much, but still uh, the transmission rate among these, in these heterosexual couples uh, were rather low. This is why I quote the Padian study here. It's a large, well-done study, although some AIDS denialists still refer to the Padian study and think that it shows that HIV does not exist, which is not correct. Padian herself is not an AIDS denialist, and you cannot derive from that study that, that HIV does not exist. All you can derive from that study is that people with a mainly non-African ethnic background don't transmit HIV that much, even if there is no successful antiretroviral treatment. Now, conclusive evidence for a causal role of intravaginal practices for cleaning purposes or dry sex is still lacking. The phenomenon does exist. A uh, African women have dry sex. They dry out the vagina with detergents or with herbal powders and such, uh, but uh, there is no conclusive evidence. This is a large review, a large uh, review article. There is no conclusive evidence 
that this is the that this is the cause some women only use dry sex this is also an interesting thing uh, some some women use detergents or those those products for cleaning the vagina not for having dry and very rough sex this is not the purpose sometimes people even understand dry sex differently not as having rough sex but as uh, as the the absence of vaginal discharge so as the absence of, of vaginal infection with a lot of discharge and in this way i think dry sex is even a sensible a very sensible concept because there is a lot of vaginal of bacterial vaginosis in black persons and they really have have some trouble there and there has also been now this is this is the first study that i have to additionally refer to and give you the source this is not in my original article but uh, just comes to my mind now uh, this is a first study showing that uh, dry sex can sometimes mean sex without vaginal discharge without infectious discharge from the vagina and the second thing is that people found out that as i always suspected i know what the ladies do uh, they also put detergents and soaps in their vaginas or other other products or at least lubricants they they put those products in their vaginas all the time and everywhere not only in africa women do insert stuff do insert products in their in their vagina even although most gynecologists say that this is not uh, a good idea and now and sexual violence this is the other factor and sexual violence seems low in explanatory power as well because i know that, that this is a cruel or a, that this is a, 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 a brutal objectivity that i have th here but uh, sexual violence is of course a bad thing but I don't think that it explains the su sub-Saharan African pandemic of HIV. Because although, for instance, South Africa, Botswana or Lesotho apparently suffer a rape epidemic, I refer to the, to, the, to the international rape statistics here, although, for instance, South Africa, Botswana or Lesotho apparently suffer a rape epidemic, the number of police reported rapes per 100,000 persons and year is similar for Zimbabwe, Sweden, Belgium and Australia. But in Kenya, Uganda or Cameroon, moreover, this, this rape rate is much lower than in many European or South American countries. So this is a, is a, uh, a bad factor for explaining the pandemic. Sm now, small sexual networks, that's what they mention for the epidemic among African Americans. Small sexual networks in ethnic minorities are a possible explanation for the epidemic among African Americans, but they obviously fail in many sub-Saharan African countries where black persons are in the majority. And conversely, the other way around, non-African ethnic or other mi minorities, religious minorities and so on, seem to be spared by HIV in many places of the world. So this uh, small sexual network thing cannot explain it. Uh, another thing, the force of infection factor, something I, I, I also don't mention in the original article, but this comes to my mind and I also wrote a lot of comments about it here on YouTube where people say that it's the force of infection. Uh, those minorities, the ethnic minorities in, in, in North America, especially blacks, have this uh, have great epidemic because, uh, well, they have high prevalences. In the f They have high prevalences of HIV. And so inf infection is much more likely to occur in this minority because they have a higher infection rate. But this is a secondary, this is simply, of course, this, this may be a factor, but uh, uh, it's not a first factor. It's not a primary factor because this is a secondary phenomenon because the, the virus had to enter this minority somehow in the first place. And it uh, apparently did not succeed in entering other minorities in this way. So the, this force of infection factor, the high prevalence that is there, that is present in minority, in, in this minority, the black minority in North America, this cannot explain uh, this, the spread among blacks because it's a secondary phenomenon. The, the virus had to enter into that group in the first place and this is not explained adequately or plausibly. Finally, biological factors have been put forward. This is uh, very interesting. This is actually my favorite subject, those biological uh, factors, because I also uh, uh, embrace a biological factor for the spread. They were recently reviewed by Cole et al. with a focus by Rupert Cole in Toronto, my good old friend Rupert Cole. 
who doesn't speak to me either when I re when I send him emails. They they were recently reviewed by Cole et al. with a focus on viral. Cl it's, it's a perf it's a it's a very per it's a very good article, very knowledgeable, very well researched. They were recently reviewed by Cole et al. with a focus on viral clade, host genetics, and co-infections. Now, subtype C, the viral clade, what type of the virus it is. Subtype C is indeed the predominant clade of HIV-1 in sub-Saharan Africa, but the authors discard this factor for the African pandemic, since people of sub-Saharan African ethnic origin, that is, people of recent sub-Saharan African ethnic origin, uh, if the human history research is correct, uh, we all derive from sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but, but the authors discard this factor since people of sub-Saharan African ethnic origin are also disproportionately affected in areas where a different clade predominates, for example in North America. Clade C is not the predominant clade in North America, but still in North America, blacks are disproportionately affected. So it's uh, the, the, the culprit cannot be this subtype C of the HIV virus. Conversely, the other way around, India, where subtype C does predominate, has a much lower prevalence, about 025 to 0.28% of HIV AIDS, than do most countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, Cole et al. mentioned the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation as an immunological protective mechanism against infection and disease progression. This is a receptor on CD4 positive cells, and HIV also relies on that receptor, not only on the CD4 receptor, but also on the CCR5 receptor in order to enter the cells somehow. And this mutation of the CCR5 the receptor gene seems to occur frequently in Europe and Western Asia, but is uncommon in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the allele was found to be absent in most ethnic populations in India too, whose low HIV prevalence has just been mentioned, so it's not a good explanation. And it was obviously, and, and moreover, it was obviously unable, this, this mutation was obviously unable to prevent infection rates in Caucasian urban MSM from being in the same range as those of the general population in various countries in sub-Saharan Africa. This is also maybe a cruel truth uh, uh, to mention, uh, but uh, in many countries, Europe, even, even well, uh, uh, yeah, well-developed uh, countries, European countries where healthcare is good, uh, you you find rates of HIV and MSM of about well five five to fifteen percent even. The the proportion in MSM who are HIV positive is quite high in almost all the countries. Yeah, three to fifteen percent. In the Caribbean, it's worse. It's tw it's about one fourth to one third of MSM who are HIV positive, uh, and this this uh, uh, is almost is comparable or comparable to the to the to the to the range or to the to the variability in sub-Saharan Africa, where you find many countries where you have a have a, a prevalence of about of about well one two three percent up to twenty thirty forty percent. Swaziland is is said to be the country where HIV, where the the uh, prevalence of HIV is is the highest in all the countries. As far as the non-sexually transmitted co-infections like malaria, tuberculosis, schistosomiasis, or other parasitoses are concerned, call it I'll discuss, and they are prevalent in sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. Where that is very true. Call and call it I'll discuss how they increase the viral load of HIV as well as possibly the number of activated CD4 positive cells in anogenital sites. CD4 positive cells are the target of HIV. And so they, with those infections, with those co-infections, non-sexually transmitted, malaria, that fly transmits it, tuberculosis, a bacterium in the air, schistosomiasis, that is a parasite, or other parasitosis, uh, th uh, they increase the viral load of HIV and maybe the number of activated CD4 positive cells in anogenital sites, and so they increase the likelihood of transmission. The higher the viral load, the higher the likelihood of transmission, and the higher the number of CD4 positive cells, uh, the more likely is it that HIV finds a target there uh, in those cells. Yet again, this difference alone fails to explain the ethnic tropism of the virus in areas of the world where these non-sexually transmitted co-infections are rare. Those co-infections are rather rare in the US. Malaria, tuberculosis, schistosomiasis, and other parasitosis. But blacks still 
are the, the main victim group there. And also these co-infection or these, these non-sexually transmitted infections, malaria, tuberculosis and so on, uh, abound in, uh, in areas other than sub-Saharan Africa, but their HIV rates are not as high as they are in sub-Saharan Africa. The sexually transmitted co-infections as well as abnormal vaginal flora and bacterial vaginosis are however an extraordinarily good candidate for a causal explanation of the HIV pandemic because in line with the findings already mentioned, Call et al. found these conditions to prevail disproportionately in black persons around the world. So this is quite, um, quite consistent. So it is a good candidate for a causal factor. Piper et al. found the association of bacterial vaginosis and incident STIs to be influenced by African-American ethnicity even after adjusting for sexual practices and other confounding variables. So this is quite astounding. Other STIs, other STIs other than HIV are indeed considered to be the most important cofactor for HIV transmission. This was already found out in that Padian study, I refer to this one here, but this has consistently been found uh, during the last three decades. Nevertheless, the reasons for both the disproportionate spread of STIs and the high prevalence of bacterial vaginosis in black persons, just as a side, as a side remark, bacterial vaginosis is, a, is actually an int a very interesting concept because it's an infection and it's sexual, but it's not transmitted. The bacteria are usually already there in the vagina. They're, they're usually in, in, in low numbers, but they're usually already in the vagina. So they're not transmitted from the partner. But still, bacterial vaginosis mostly occurs only when you have sex. So it's, it's sexual, it's in the sexual organ, and it occurs once you have sex. And it's an infection, of course, mostly caused by, by Gardnerella vaginalis bacteria, but it's not transmitted. So it's a very interesting concept as far as infectious diseases are concerned. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, uh, where was that? Nevertheless, the reasons for both the disproportionate spread of STIs and the high prevalence of bacterial vaginosis in black persons are poorly understood. One may wonder whether this ethnicity-related difference, this specifically ethnicity-related difference, is not a secondary phenomenon due to some more fundamental factor, which could at the same time be more intrinsically tied to HIV transmission, and which one might ignore when hastily attributing, as Myron Cohen did, when hastily attributing a central role for HIV spread to other STIs and a suboptimal vaginal flora. Yeah, of course, at first sight, that is quite plausible. It's a good candidate. It's um, SCI spread is high in all these sexual high-risk groups for HIV, but still, you should be more careful there. You might ignore, because you might ignore, a more fundamental factor, which is maybe more intrinsically tied to HIV, and which also causes those STIs. Yeah, you might ignore that when hastily attributing a central role for HIV spread to other STIs and a suboptimal vaginal flora. Moreover, even for this hot candidate for the other STIs, causality with regard to HIV spread, causality has not been established in the scientific community and it seems quite questionable given the failure of most attempts to reduce new HIV infections by more effectively treating other STIs. There have been many studies now where people tried to reduce new HIV infections by more effectively and more carefully treating other STIs but most of those studies have failed now. So this is a hint that it's not a causal factor. It's a cofactor. It certainly is a cofactor. It certainly has something to do with HIV spread but it's not the cause of HIV spread, those other STIs. It's implausible because if you prevent the cause, you should also prevent the effect. But this does not work for STIs. If you prevent the other STIs, you don't prevent new HIV infections. And I also refer her here to, uh, to two recent large reviews of those many attempts to reduce new HIV infections by more, more effectively treating other STIs. I don't refer to just some uh, simple studies or single studies 
uh, where it failed. I refer to the reviews where people showed that most of the attempts now sadly have failed. Now it may be speculated that perhaps with the exception of elevated concurrency and elevated prevalence of STI's vaginosis, most of the factors which have been held responsible, including those which I have not discussed here, that is circumcision, condom use, prevention, knowledge, testing, migration, mobility, sex work, gender inequality, are in conjunction comparable in many places of the world with relatively low HIV rates, so that even an essentially multifactorial etiology of the HIV AIDS pandemic seems somewhat unpromising unless the list of possible factors gets some new input. India or South American countries are candidates for such places, but more careful research would be needed for such a claim to be validated. Now, India, no circumcision among Hindus and Buddhists. You have gender inequality, you also have sex work, sexual exploitation in India. Why should the prevention knowledge be so much better in India or in, or in South American countries? Why should people test there much more than in Sub-Saharan Africa? Migration mobility is a global phenomenon. Yeah, I've just I've just read an article or, uh, or a German news magazines reported about uh, on an article on the the spread of HIV, the development of the pandemic, and the spread in the 20th century. HIV started in the 1920s already. They say, and they say that the the trains, the railway system is responsible for the for the spread of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa, but. Uh, trains and railways are not really specific for sub-Saharan Africa, so this cannot explain the spread of HIV, this, uh, this enormous spread of HIV, that well. Now lastly, HIV seems in principle perfectly able to leave the continent where it originated. I also put forward that argument in my plausibility video. Even if you say, well, the, all those factors maybe cannot uh, cannot explain that too well, but the epidemic started in Africa. So um, it, the, it's no surprise that HIV spread in Sub-Saharan Africa because it came from there. But that doesn't help because HIV seems in principle perfectly able to leave the continent where it originated given the predicament of MSM and black persons worldwide, which renders spatiotemporal explanatory approaches implausible as well. Now the, ep the, the pandemic or epidemic in, so in um, in the US in black persons is almost as bad, in some centuries at least, is almost as bad as in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. In uh, Washington, I think, the, 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 the prevalence or the, the rates are comparable or even worse than in Uganda. And HIV did not start, the virus did not, did not start its journey in Washington. It started its journey. This is from that, from that article that has just been published. If I understand it correctly, HIV came from Kinshasa. This is the birthplace of of HIV. Um, well, if it is true, uh, but it did not. It certainly did not uh, did not uh, start its journey in Washington. Um, now, in conclusion, it is by no means impossible that the pandemic can be explained by one of aforementioned behavioral, socioeconomic or biological factors or some composite of them. Their plausibility, however, remains low for reasons of lacking consensus within the scientific community or of lacking global coherence and uniformity. This analysis now, my analysis here, suggests that the pandemic has something to do with ethnicity we have to face the facts here. I also say uh, something about the objection or the the the, the reproach of racism here uh, in the in the uh, video on the on the politic on the political objections. I think it's not um, it's not a valid objection. This analysis suggests that the pandemic has something to do with ethnicity and anal intercourse. Again, we have to face the facts here. It's the biological factor. The sexual behavior. Uh, has been vastly overestimated in HIV research. It's the per per uh, it's the per act risk of transmitting HIV in MSM, the the per act risk of receptive anal intercourse. This is uh, the the central factor. This is what the epi those epidemiological studies uh, uh, done by Bayer. This uh, this is what they show.
the biological factor, the, the per act transmission risk of anal intercourse, this is the central factor in MSM. Sexual behavior uh, is overestimated in the MSM pandemic. Yet this must be so. Now, uh, yeah, uh, the analysis now suggests that uh, this pandemic has something to do causally uh, with ethnicity and anal intercourse. Yet this must be so for reasons of more fine-grained properties of black persons and the anus and rectum. Now, direct evidence for anatomical differences in the sexual high-risk groups. I talked about this many times, but now, very systematically, the study. Pendergrass et al. studied the vaginal shape in 23, this is what she says, 23 African-American, but now in parentheses, as she says, 7 nulliparous, 8 uniparous, and 11 multiparous. 7 nulliparous, 8 Uniparous and 11 multiparous uh, African Americans. So, this, uh, if I calculate correctly, this makes uh, 15, 26, but she writes 23 anyway. In 23 African American, 39 Caucasian, and 15 Hispanic women, in the Caucasian women, uh, 13 each uh, had no births one birth and uh, several births, and 15 Hispanic women there, one was nulliparous, uh, seven uniparous, and seven multiparous, uh, and she studied the vaginal shape, their vaginal shape, by taking vinyl polysiloxane casts in lying, standing, and sitting positions, and all women were at least 18 years of age and had experienced sexual intercourse. In 42% of the African-American women, a slim shape variant, the pumpkin seed, she called it, was discovered. This was characterized as being very wide from side to side, but having little depth from anterior to posterior walls, just as a pumpkin seed, and could not be found in Caucasian or Hispanic women, whose typical vaginal casts were conical, parallel heart, or slug-shaped. No correlation between shape and either age or parity was found in the Caucasian group. In addition to the moulds, the maximally comfortable introital caliber was measured by having the subject insert a lubricated polypropylene Erlenmeyer flask as far back in her vagina as possible without causing discomfort. The circumference of the flask was marked and measured and the corresponding caliber calculated. A statistically significant difference was found. The average MCIC was 3.14, 3.14 centimeters in African Americans. Now this value is again um, is again ambiguous in the study. The other value that she gives is 3.73 centimeters, and 4.66 centimeters in Caucasians. Introital measurements could only be obtained from five Hispanic subjects, which forbade comparison with this group. You, you cannot reach uh, s significant um, statistical comparisons with only five subjects, so they couldn't compare the, the Hispanic subjects, the Hispanic introital measurements, with the Caucasian and African-American measurements. The average caliber of an erect penis at the base in young men, and as measured by a health professional, is 3.95 centimeters, almost 4 centimeters, with a standard deviation of 0.38 centimeters. And this group had a hundred and eleven men in it. For a study on a controlled way to perform lateral sphincterotomies in patients with chronic anal fissure, an ailment common among MSM, Cho measured the anal caliber in a way similar to Pendergrass's measurement of the introital caliber. Lubricated conical calibrators scaled with one millimeter diameter increments were inserted into the anus until the perianal skin, the skin around the anus, was just about to be depressed in the oral direction. At this point, the scale was red. This objectification for measuring the distensibility of soft tissue may seem even less precise than Pendergrass's semi-subjective method, inserting it until it starts to become uncomfortable, but a high correlation 0.958 was obtained for two independent examiners and a group of 45 patients. This maximum longitudinally tension-free anal caliber was determined in an anorectally healthy group of patients coming for arthroscopy or other procedures and in anal fissure patients before sphincterotomy. 106, 106 anal fissure patients and 40 healthy patients. In both groups, measurement took place under spinal anesthesia. The value was 34.6 plus minus 1.4 millimeters, mean plus minus standard deviation, 
in the healthy group, confounding effects of age, gender, weight, and height not being statistically significant, and 29.0 plus minus 2.7 millimeters in Fisher patients. From these direct measurements of anal genital caliber, let's face the facts, it follows that vaginal narrowness in women of recent sub-Saharan African descent seems significantly increased both in terms of vaginal shape and in terms of introital caliber, which seems to have roughly the same value as a normal anal caliber. The legitimacy of this claim is of course diminished by the different methods of measurement for anus and vaginal introitus, by the small size of the sample groups in the vaginal study, as well as by missing standard deviations in its results in other lapses such as several ambiguous figures. I talked about that. In conclusion, direct evidence for NAA seems scarce, I admit. Nevertheless, the few data that have been gathered are curious and may serve as an important piece of the puzzle. Now, indirect, indirect evidence for anatomical differences in the sexual high-risk groups. In comparison with little direct evidence, there seems to be plenty of indirect evidence for NAA in a large proportion of HIV high-risk groups. These findings are evidence in virtue of abductive reasoning, meaning that if NAA were true, this concept of abductive reasoning uh, stems from Peirce, Charles Sanders. Peirce, the great American philosopher among the pragmatists, I think, or he, he counts as one of the one of the pragmatists, great philosopher of science. Abductive reasoning. The, the, now these findings are evidence in virtue of abductive reasoning, meaning that if NAA, if narrow anal genital anatomy were true, then the following phenomena would be expected and could be explained by NAA. Abductive reasoning is the, the form of reasoning that has the least, well, the least uh, deductive power, that, that has uh, the least uh, logical uh, stringency or logical, logical correctness. But you have to use it. Abductive re in order to find new things, in order to, to get to new ideas and to, to, to find a new discovery, you have to use abductive reasoning. Induction and deduction are not good for finding new for, for the detective. They are not good ways of reasoning for the detective. The detective uses abduction. This is not logically very, very correct, very stringent, very clear. But in practical science or in, in detective stories, in criminology, in practical sciences, you have to use abductive reasoning. The doctor is someone who, when in Washington a, a blue ball is uh, is found, and in uh, New York you have an urn where thirty percent of the of the balls that are in it are blue, then you the the doctor is someone who 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 would say, well, then that blue ball in Washington certainly comes from that urn over the over <laughs> at the other end in New York. This is how. This is how medical people or how detectives make judgments or make conclusions. It's an odd way. It's not logically stringent, but it's uh, the uh, firstly the way uh, that it works in in practical sciences in in, in detective reasoning, uh, and it's also the the only way in which knowledge in science or in the scientific process in development in which knowledge is extended. A deduction, you cannot derive very new things or very exciting things from mere deduction, from very logically stringent things. And induction also has its its limits. You can only show that, well, maybe the future, ex the future results will be similar because I have already found so many things here. If I take a ball from the urn, and it's blue, and I take the next one out, it's blue again, and I take 10 out of the urn, it, and they're all blue. You can infer that all of the balls that are in the urn are blue. But um, you don't find anything excitingly new, even in induction. Now, Rosser et al. and Damon et Rosser found relatively this is such a phenomenon that would be expected if narrow anogenital anatomy were true, and that could also be explained by narrow anogenital anatomy. We know why this phenomenon occurs, 
if we say, well, there is narrow inner genital at- anatomy, then that, that would explain it. That would tell us the why. That would tell us why, why this phenomenon occurs. Now, Rosser et, uh, uh, and uh, et al. and da- Damon and Rosser found relatively low rates of anodysperunia, trouble pain during anal intercourse in MSM, 12% and 14% respectively, comparing them to rates of colpodysperunia in women pain trouble during vaginal intercourse. Colpo, that, that word stem stands for the, the vagina. It's the, the Greek term, I think, for the, for the vagina. This form of anodysperunia was, however, already to the extent of sex being too painful to continue, not just a sweet, mild pain all the time, but uh, really pain to the extent of sex being too painful to continue or involving severe pain and of occurring lifelong all the time, not just a few seconds and only during some instances of sexual intercourse, but lifelong. Participants rated a lack of lubrication, of feeling relaxed or of digital proctic stimulation, finger stimulation, as the most important factors. It was also associated with anxiety or problems with gay identity and with male sexual partners. This is what they found. But in a large recent study involving 1,752 participants, in a large recent study, however, which used an anal adaptation, an anal adaptation of a validated female sexual function index, 59% of anal receptive MSM reported some degree of pain during or after sexual intercourse. Mild anal dyspareunia, according to the index, was present in 33%, mild to moderate in 17%, moderate in 4%, and severe in 2%. Ten risk factors were studied, including stimulation, lubrication, steady relationship, total number of sexual partners, how many partners they had already, etc. Now comes the surprise, now comes the Again, the brutal fact, yet age and the frequency of sex were the only factors which remained significantly correlated with anal dyspareunia on multivariate logistic regression analysis, both higher age and higher frequency being protective. So there are statistical means methods where you can, in a way, factor out or where you can uh, isolate the pure influences. There are statistical tests that tell you well, this factor is an independent factor that has to do something with, in this case, anodysperunia. Whereas there may be factors that, are, that depend upon other factors. It may be the case, for example, it may be the case that um, people who don't use stimulation, who don't stimulate before sex, also are people who don't use uh, lubrication or enough lubrication. So there could be cross-links between those Uh, between those individual factors. But there are statistical methods with the help of which you can subtract those cross-links and isolate the independent risk factors. And this is what they did here. And the only factors, as I said, which remain significantly correlated with anodysperunia on multivariate logistic regression analysis were higher age and higher frequency of sex, both being protective, both leading to less anodysperunia. All the other factors, stimulation, lubrication, steady relationship, and total, that is, um, steady relationship meaning that, well, there shouldn't be many problems with, with gay identity or with male sexual partners, with the male sexual partner, because it's a steady relationship after all. So this psychological factor does not play that much of a role. All those factors, they are somehow interconnected or connected with other, with those, with one of those other ten risk factors that they that they studied. They are somehow interconnected, and they all can don't represent statistically an independent risk factor. So they don't play that much of a role. They don't have something to do intrinsically with anal dyspareunia, most probably. This is what those statistical tests tell us. So the frequency of sex and maybe age but there could be some some other influence because people who uh, still have receptive anal intercourse in in higher ages are the ones that do well there that um, succeed in having anal intercourse this could be uh, a factor an indirect uh, bias if you wish 
I can fully confirm this result from anecdotal anal self-experiments. Again, let's face the facts. I can fully confirm this result from anecdotal anal self-experiments with regular inspections of my own anus with the help of an electronic video camera where I've found that pain or lacerations do not occur if the anus is dilated to the caliber of, a, to the caliber of an erect penis every three to five days, but almost promptly recur as soon as this time interval is extended further. This suggests that, accelerated aging not being a possible intervention, regular intercourse or self-dilation could play a central role in preventing dyspareunia and perhaps also injury to the anogenital organs. Already Lester et al. measured the circumference of the anal sphincters in dead human specimens and extrapolating from physiological knowledge on the distensibility of muscle tissue inferred that the anal sphincter complex cannot be dilated with lasting effects and is unlikely to suffer damage if dilation is gentle and limited to 12.8 cm circumference, a caliber of 4.07 cm. I talked about that, about this Lester et al. study in some greater detail in, I think, the MSM2 video, the ass video, if you wish. Given the fast regeneration and great malleability, now given the fast reg regeneration and great malleability of epithelial in contrast to muscle tissue, all this suggests that the unfolded circumference and the distensibility of the anoderm play a more important role in the etiology of anodysperunia and anal fissures than do the muscle tone and circumference. Why? Because, again, as I said, the esteretal showed that the anal sphincter, that, that the muscle, cannot be dilated with lasting effects by penile penetration if it is gentle. The sphincter itself, the muscle, cannot be dilated with lasting effects. But still, there seems to be some effect that lasts three to five days, but it cannot be the sphincter, the muscle, because that muscle cannot be dilated with lasting effects. But something must be dilated with lasting effects three to five days, and this must be the skin. This must be the anoderm, the skin of the anus. Epithelial injury occurs in large proportions of HIV high-risk groups. Anal bleeding during sex was found to affect roughly a third of Mexican MSM, at least sometimes. This study involved 2,758 men, so again I refer to a large study, at least sometimes. Now this is rather old, but uh, this is due to the fact that there are simply not many studies that uh, involved bleeding as a factor, that, that even uh, examined that factor. Now, anal bleeding during sex was found to affect roughly a third of Mexican MSM, at least sometimes, and was significantly associated with being HIV positive, even on multivariate, uh, even on multivariate analysis involving behavioral, psychological, and other medical risk factors. In the total study population of MSM in Mexico City who took an HIV test from June 1991 to December 1992, 9% of all infections were statistically attributable to anal bleeding, and among those affected by it at least sometimes 42.6% of infections were attributable to it. It may be objected that the cross-sectional character of the study could mask the possible effect of anal bleeding being caused by HIV infection, but even among the men who tested negative, it occurred in 26.3% sometimes and in 7.4% from half the time to always. Similarly, strong associations between anal rectal trauma or factors indicative of it and HIV seropositivity had been found previously in one other cross-sectional and two prospective studies, while one longitudinal study found a null association, yet this one referred to a cohort where the baseline analysis had revealed a multivariate relative odds of 7.72 for the highest level of anal rectal trauma. This is a a measure of the of the this may indicate or may may be interpreted as a measure for the effect for the strength of the effect or the size of the effect nevertheless except for the recommendation of lubricants of uh, water-based lubricants this factor and its prevention that is the bleeding and its prevention never reached the focus of hiv aids edu education 
even this doubtlessly helpful remedy may have to be taken with a grain of salt, given the above hypothesis of a central role of the anoderm of the skin of the anus and its maximum distended circumference. Indeed, paradoxically, elevated lubricant use for anal intercourse has been identified as a risk factor for the acquisition of STIs in a non-interventional analysis. That is where they didn't say, well, half of the group uh, uses lubricants and the other, the others won't use lubricants and we, we wait and see uh, which part of the group or which group gets more STIs but they just asked do you use lubricants or do you do you use copious amounts of lubricants or consistently do you consistently have to use lubricants uh, or in copious amounts and they found that the people who did had a higher risk for the acquisition of STIs than, than people who, who did not use copious or elevated amounts of lubricants. Now the necessity of much, well, well, this is an anomaly of course, because people recommend use lubricants, then the tears will uh, will not occur or will be less will be less likely to occur, and uh, so you shouldn't you shouldn't acquire so many STIs. But they found well if people who use copious amounts of lubricants, who have elevated lubricant use, that they are more at risk of acquiring STIs. This is clearly an anomaly. But how could that be explained? I think it can be explained because the necessity of much lubricant may indicate marked anal narrowness. People who have pain trouble may think, oh, I, it's not enough lube, I need more lube. And so the necessity of much lubricant may, however, indicate marked anal narrowness, which in turn may increase the chance of STI transmission via traumatic lesions. Now, because physically, this is quite interesting, physically, lubricants decrease the friction between penis and anoderm, but they cannot increase the circumference of the latter. By the way, I think friction between skin, skin and skin friction, outer skin friction, does not really occur during the, the, the unspeakable act of copulation. So there, is, there is some friction, but not between outer skin and outer skin. The friction occurs in the connective tissue below the skin, both in the penis and in the, in the, in the, in the, in the anorectum and in the vagina. The connective tissue below the epithelium, below the outer skin, takes away the friction or the friction occurs there because the skin goes back and forth over the shaft of the penis and the skin also goes back and forth in vagina and anus. And so during the actual act of copulation, well, when you draw back considerably or, or push, push it in considerably there there is some friction between skin and skin but during the actual uh, copulation movements uh, I think there is almost no friction between skin and skin this is quite interesting people don't really uh, are not I don't think that many people are aware of this of this fact of life now anyway physically lubricants decrease the friction between penis and anoderm during penetration, but they cannot increase the circumference of the latter. They cannot increase the circumference of the anoderm. So they don't work. They don't cure the cause, the lubricants. Likewise, the association between the use of relaxant sex drugs, for example, inhaled nitrites or poppers, in HIV infection, which even led denialists to infer that the drugs cause AIDS, and which otherwise has been attributed to disinhibition and carelessness of drug users, uh, may be due to anal narrowness as a common cause for both variables. Anal narrowness may cause both that people use drugs at all, sex drugs at all, and may cause a higher infection ra rate or higher infection risk of HIV. Because the drugs may unconsciously or deliberately serve as a self-medication for anodyspareunia with questionable effectiveness. They too only reduce friction by relaxing the internal sphincter, but they fail to widen the anoderm. So the, the sphincter below the skin does relax, but the skin does not does not widen does not increase its circumference the prevalence of vaginal bleeding in south africans is comparable to that of anal bleeding in msm coital genital bleeding in the previous 3 months in the previous 3 months was reported by roughly a fifth of both males and females in one and by roughly a third in two studies by roughly a third of both males and females in two studies so this is quite comparable to those numbers in Mexican 
MSM. It was associated with unprotected intercourse with multiple partners with an STI diagnosis with African ethnicity and with condom breaks. Part of it was attributed to menstruation, but some of these factors may imply traumatic causes, condom breaks, of course. Even unprotected intercourse may imply that it's, that it's traumatic causes or that it has something to do with, with tightness, with narrowness, with, with vaginal tightness. Because, again, let's face the facts, if the, the orifice is quite narrow, it's not so easy to penetrate. Men have to struggle a bit. And uh, sometimes, if they're not really excited, but if it's uh, just a loveless tired uh, copulation, then it's uh, more difficult to, pe to uh, put on the condom and then penetrate. So even this unprotected intercourse thing may not be a behavioral thing, but it may also be related or be connected with, with, that, with that organ variant, with this uh, narrower introitus. It's uh, more difficult to penetrate it. And so if excitement is not too high, then the use of a condom will uh, even complicate matters more, to put it in that way. Now, a prospective cohort study even found a significant association between coital genital bleeding and HIV zero conversion in sub-Saharan Africa, in South Africa there. Few studies exist on the... The study was done by Kalichmann. Uh, he is a bright guy, but he... He uh, concluded that it's behavior that this is behavioral factors. They shouldn't be the those Africans. This he didn't say it in the, in this way, but uh, he said this is behavioral factors. This this bleeding um, stems from behavior behavioral factors, and uh, uh, they one should recommend that Africans have sex in a way that bleeding does not occur. So he says in a way, well, they are so rough, they are so aggressive in sex that, that the women bleed. So they should be less rough and less aggressive and then maybe the women don't bleed anymore. But I, I think they are not to blame if it's, the, if it's simply an organ variant. They're simply not to blame for this bleeding. It's not a behavioral thing. Nature is to blame. Nature is the culprit, as in many things and in, in, in many complexities in medicine. It turned out that nature is actually the culprit and that behavior is not responsible, that we didn't do it ourselves. We didn't, we are not responsible for this disease. Nature is to blame for it. Now, a prospective cohort study, well, I, did, I said that, uh, well, as a comparison now, few studies exist on the prevalence of coital vaginal bleeding in other ethnicities. We don't know how, what's the prevalence of coital vaginal bleeding in other ethnicities. Yet in a large British survey, 1,513 participants, the 12-month cumulative incidence of post-coital bleeding in women aged 18 to 54 years was only 6%, yeah, as compared to a fifth and a third, that's rather low, a low percentage. Concurrency, which is comparable to somewhat equally frequent open relationships in MSM, may itself be evidence for NAA, the causal chain being NAA, narrow anal genital anatomy, causes anal genital health problems, which in turn impede pleasant regular intercourse in a monogamous setting. A similar explanation stands to reason for the phenomenon of rife secondary abstinence. This is a thing that I discovered only recently. Uh, another thing that actually explains and that fits very well to my, uh, to my theory, there is rife. Uh, secondary abstinence in sub-Saharan Africa is rife. This concept means you have no sex in the last 12 months, although you already had sex. And uh, this phenomenon abounds in sub-Saharan Africa. So how does this fit? How does this fit this promiscuity theory? That, that that blacks are so much more promiscuous, are so much more have so much more concurrent partners in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, their their sexuality is so wild. How does this fit? That in sub-Saharan Africa there is much more secondary abstinence than in other parts of the world. But it's simply it can be explained in this way. Because the the act is not fun in some people, and then some people decide uh, to abstain from sex. This also has parallels or is is comparable to the situation in MSM, 
Martin Dannecker, a famous German sexologist, especially a sexologist on on um, uh, on uh, MSM or on on homosexuality, found out that men who have sex with men masturbate more than heterosexual men. Even if they are in a relationship, they masturbate more, they, they, they watch more pornography and so on than heterosexual men in relationships and, and out of relationships. Sexuality is more difficult. Again, let's face the facts and I want to change it. I want to make sexuality just as easy in Africans African Americans and MSM, as it is in 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 in, in heterosexuals of a, of a different ethnic origin, sexuality is simply more difficult in MSM and African Americans and Africans. They are not the sluts, the aggressive wild ones, but they are the ones who have trouble with it. People always blame. This is this is this is responsible for this HIV spread. This is responsible for this pandemic. People don't think logically, people think in a paranoid way often, and they always blame the behavior for, for a disease. Even now, even in this, in the, in this, mod in this time of, of modern medicine, of natural sciences and so on, even then they still blame mainly the behavior. This is a, this is a very human thing. They blamed behavior for childbed fever. It was the, the conduct, the, the base conduct of the mothers, the sluts, they said, who were affected by childbed fever. And they still do that for every disease. People are paranoid. They say, well, if you're sick, if you catch this bug, then you behaved in a way that made you catch this bug. So you are to blame for this because you behaved badly, because you were wild, because you were not a good boy or a good girl. But we have to see clearly now, finally, and even bacterial vaginosis, it might be explained by more numerous microscopic cracks in the vaginal lining. They're more numerous because the, the, the orifice is narrower Bacterial vaginosis might be explained by more numerous microscopic cracks in the vaginal lining, which might nurture bacteria less typical of the vaginal microbiome. Yeah, these cracks, there is some, some blood or some fluid, some cellular fluid that comes out of those cracks, that is discharged from those little cracks. And this fluid or this blood nurtures bacteria that are less typical of the vaginal microbiome, then the Gardnerella vaginalis bacteria can become, can increase their numbers. Otherwise, they don't survive so well in the vaginal milieu. Now, even dry sex may be an epiphenomenon of NAA. Marked virginity or tight vagina cults in sub-Saharan Africa might be due to the high prevalence of a natural narrow variant, leading to feelings of insufficiency and desperate measures with drying agents in women whose vaginas are loose. I made a separate video on dry sex and there I talked about those intricacies. I'd compare this phenomenon of dry sex to penile enlargement in men. There is a natural narrow variant and so Women who don't have that natural narrow variant want to achieve narrowness by using those herbal powders and potions and detergents and so on, uh, just as uh, some men would like to have a larger penis because there is this natural phenomenon of the, of the shower type of penis that appears quite large, quite long when flaccid and only gains a few inches more when it becomes erect and they want to have something like this, yeah? A natural narrow variant is responsible for this for this um, for this feeling of insufficiency and also this tight vagina cult that you find in places in sub-saharan africa it's also quite comparable to this to the to the fascination of a tight anus of a tight uh, of a tight butt in msm those things are all exactly comparable and it's really it surprises me it it shocks me in a way that nobody that nobody saw these uh, these similarities so far it really shocks me and uh, as i said i think this fascination this tightness fascination or narrowness fascination i think it's neur it's neurotic 
people try to deal with those problems some some women in those in those dry sex studies in those uh, studies about about this tight vagina cult uh, they say well men have to struggle when they insert it and women have to hurt somehow this is the only way that sexuality works this is the the men have fun and the women have fun because they hurt i think it is it is it is a neurotic it's it's a neurotic fascination people actually suffer uh, people people suffer from this but they say well this this is the way to go this is this is how it must be and uh, in studies on on vaginal microbicides for hiv prevention people feared that the participants would not accept the researchers feared that the participants would not accept those microbicides because of their slimy consistency but surprise surprise what they found out was that very many women and men actually were quite happy with this slimy consistency of the gel because insertion or copulation was easier was much easier than before women reported that without those lubricants without those slimy microbicides they had pain but with the help of those microbicides their sex life was was significantly improved so uh, this I find this I find quite interesting as a, as a result. But again, I think lubricants uh, only reduce the friction. They don't cure the actual cause. They don't increase the caliber of the vaginal introitus or of the or of the anus. Now NAA may partly explain. This is really again let's face the facts, and this is also really a sad, brutal topic. NAA may partly explain maternal death rates, similar to its role in HIV spread, being black is a solid risk factor for pregnancy-related mortality everywhere in the world, independent of various socio-economic variables. Significant, inc uh, so, sorry, significant differences in the prevalence rates of preeclampsia, eclampsia, abruptio placentae, placenta previa, or postpartum hemorrhage could not be found between black and white women, but the case fatality rates of all five conditions were significantly higher in black women, with death from postpartum hemorrhage being 3.3 times more likely in blacks than in whites. It may be hypothesized that vaginal hemorrhage, if it occurs, is more severe due to deeper lesions or more difficult to terminate because of a different vaginal anatomy, because of a narrower vaginal anatomy. Finally, Van Sintian et al.'s result, this Belgium result, quite ingenious actually. I, the, uh, Van Sintian is one of those, uh, in a way, giants in HIV research or in anal intercourse research uh, upon whose shoulders uh, I stand. Finally, Van Sintian et al.'s result that regular intercourse may ease anal dyspareunia as well as my self-experiments and Lester et al.'s clinical observation of a temporary anal dilation whose effect lasts only a few days, so they observed the same thing as I observed in my anal self-experiments, temporary, temporary anal dilation is possible and it has an effect that lasts only a few days. So all this suggests that anal genital narrowness has a tendency to re-establish itself rapidly. Given this, NAA may explain the curious late zero conversion of 11 Nairobi female sex workers who had previously met criteria for HIV resistance. People already thought they are resistant because they are so much exposed to the virus, but still they didn't catch it. But now they did zero convert at some point in time now. And how did that happen? Well, seroconversion could be linked neither to anal sex, sex during menses, intravenous drug use, sexual violence, medical procedures, contraception method, nor other STIs. All those factors had nothing to do with it. With it. They, the researchers checked that. The only risk factor shared by all but one of the women was a reduction of sex work, where nine of them had stopped it altogether for at least two months during the preceding year for social reasons, none of them due to illness. Four of these nine women were abstinent from sex, totally abstinent from sex during the break. The other five practiced monogamy or serial monogamy. Now, it may be hypothesized that the sex workers' vaginas narrowed during the periods of less regular sexual intercourse, 
possibly leading to more, more frequent or deeper lacerations and abrasions when sex work or sexual activity was resumed, facilitating HIV infection. It was hypothesized instead that ongoing exposure, this is quite cute if I am right, it was hypothesized instead that ongoing exposure to HIV may be necessary to maintain immunity, for instance mediated by ongoing HIV-1 specific CD8 positive lymphocytic responses. That CD8 positive lymphocytes kill uh, HIV. This was uh, they suspected that this is the mechanism of of immunity in those sex workers, and so they were quite surprised uh, because those women did zero convert. They did zero convert, although they previously had those CD8 positive reactions, those CD8 positive lymphocytes that killed HIV. There is now, there is, however, a second curious finding which may refute this hypothesis, that is, that continuous uh, antigenic exposure is necessary to maintain immunity. There is a second curious finding which may refute this hypothesis, and this is starting sex work in the 1980s when the pandemic merely began, or in the early 1990s when its peak was not yet reached, conferred immunity against HIV in Nairobi's female sex workers. Each weighted year of exposure resulted in a 12-fold reduction in seroconversion risk. This could be explained neither by risk behavior, this again could be explained neither, they checked that, neither by risk behavior, STIs, seronegative HIV infection, nor age. The effect of protection by starting sex work 1985 to 1993 as against 1994 was very large despite an obvious lack of continuous antigenic exposure when the epidemic was mild. When the epidemic was very mild, HIV was not common at all, it was rather rare, and so they couldn't have had continuous antigenic exposure to HIV, but still the prevalence rates uh, slowly increased up until those epidemic rates in the in the mid 1990s but still the women who 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 started earlier who who began sex work early in 1985 or in 1990 when the peak of the pandemic was not reached they had a lot of protection against hiv because probably i think because their vagina uh, had a healthy wide caliber the, the at least, or the introitus of the vagina now taken together these two anomalies, if you combine those two anomalies, they almost refute any genetic mechanism for HIV resistance of major epidemiological significance, perhaps except for genetic factors responsible for gross anatomy for this organ variant. Mechanisms, why? Because mechanisms based on innate immunity or any biochemical entity unchanging in adulthood are ruled out as factors, as, as relevant factors, because due to the slow pace of evolution, differences in them do not develop in 10 years, let alone develop in a way that increases rather than reduces susceptibility to a lethal pathogen. Moreover, such mechanisms are conceptually unlikely to change suddenly when someone takes a break from sex work. Mechanisms based on adaptive processes involving the environment would have to be very odd. They cannot be constant once they are installed due to the first anomaly, yet they cannot rely on ongoing antigenic exposure either due to the second anomaly. Yeah, they cannot be constant. Those mechanisms, those protective mechanisms cannot be constant once they are installed due to the first anomaly because once women take a break from sex work, they do zero convert. They cannot be constant, those mechanisms that protect against HIV transmission. Yet they cannot rely on ongoing antigenic exposure either due to the second anomaly. When the epidemic was very mild, continuous exposure, ongoing antigenic exposure, could not have been the case because the epidemic was very mild. But still, the women starting early with sex work during the mid 1980s they had a lot of pro they had enormous protection against hiv although they couldn't have had ongoing antigenic exposure in the beginning there would have to be mechanisms of a kind that is somehow brought about by a lot of sex and reliably persists for long periods of time but at the same time can vanish quickly as soon as there is considerably less sex such mechanisms are by no means impossible but they are implausible. They are conceptually implausible. Indeed, for analogous reasons, Nairobi's sex workers almost refute any immunologically relevant mechanism for HIV spread 
pertaining to genital microstructure or microbiology just as well. For example, a bacterium which confers immunity on a large proportion of 1980 sex workers, yeah, it could be a, a bacterium that is responsible for the for that immunity against HIV. For example, a bacterium which confers immunity on a large proportion of 1980 sex workers who then lastingly keep it, but that takes years of sex work to be transmitted and at the same time is eliminated by the body in weeks with less sex, would be a biological entity whose existence is a priori improbable. Yeah, this is, does not sound very plausible. Any microstructural difference? Maybe ectopic columnar epithelium the vagina is mostly lined with or by squamous epithelium multiple strata of squamous epithelium whereas columnar epithelium may be this is just a conjecture may be more prone to hiv more susceptible to hiv transmission and so it could also be the case that some women might have more columnar epithelium ectopic columnar epithelium in their vaginal lining. Uh, th this could be another microstructural difference uh, that could predispose or that could make one susceptible to HIV transmission. And now if that is the factor or that if that should be this mechanism then you would have to assume or then you would have to say well then the, the sexuality, this regular sex should make this ectopic columnar epithelium vanish and through regular sex it might stay away for a long time but then the columnar epithelium uh, the ectopic columnar epithelium would have to come back in weeks with less sex but this also seems somewhat implausible why should it come back and also this is this is actually kind of an innate uh, structure and there you would also have to say or you would also stumble upon the fact that why would the older sex workers or why would the the age was not was not important why would the sex workers who started early who started during sex work during the 18 during the 1980s the mid 1980s why should they have well in that case less ectopic columnar epithelium or well, well, it might have vanished through regular intercourse. This this might explain it. But again, it's not a very plausible idea. This is not the very, a very plausible idea. Why should that ectopic columnar epithelium uh, vanish through sexual intercourse and come back as soon as there is no regular intercourse anymore? It's uh, it's highly implausible that that it's genital microstructures that are responsible. If you combine these two anomalies, it's highly implausible that there are microstructural differences or that there are uh, genetic differences that explain the, the, um, the sub-Saharan African HIV pandemic. The simplest and most straightforward explanation for both anomalies, for both these anomalies in uh, Nairobi female sex workers is narrow anal genital anatomy. An argument from pathological principles, the available evidence and eliminative induction. Now given the low explanatory power of various behavioral and socioeconomic factors, it seems rational to assume that the central factor of the pandemic is biological. Let us further assume that health-related biological mechanisms can exhaustively be described as pertaining either to neoplasm, circulation of the vascular system, infection or inflammation, genetics, biochemistry or microphysiology, anatomical variant or trauma. This is not totally arbitrary. This, uh, this distribution or this, this categorization is not completely arbitrary. It's the classical or the, it's the, the, it's the, the, the pathological principles in medicine. Many people categorize diseases in this way. Almost all diseases can be put under at least one of those categories. If these premises are granted, the available evidence allows the following eliminative induction. Now, A and B, neoplasia and circulation or the vascular system, vascular problems, may be discarded as conceptually almost logically implausible. Yeah, why should they have neoplasia? cancer or, tu or tumors, sub-Saharan Africans, that um, 
make them susceptible to HIV, people would see those tumors or those neoplasias, especially if they are malignant tumors or neoplasias, because if they are malignant, that means people would die. They be, would become very sick. Circulation, the vascular system, why should that be so much different in sub-Saharan Africans? So A and B can be discarded. C, infection or inflammation. I think they can also be discarded because the factor they can also be discarded as a as a causal factor for HIV spread because the factor of non sexually transmitted infections is globally incoherent. As I said, you have almost no non sexually transmitted infections, malaria, tuberculosis, and so on, uh, uh, of high prevalence in in North America, but still. Blacks are disproportionately affected in North America. So C can be discarded because the factor of non-sexually transmitted infections is globally incoherent and because the higher prevalence of STIs and vaginosis in the high-risk groups is itself a mystery which suggests, which, which actually should, should suggest that it is a secondary phenomenon. Furthermore, causality has not been established for STI's vaginosis and seems implausible because most interventions have failed now. D seems implausible, genetics and microphysiology, biochemistry and such. D seems implausible because the infection dynamics in Nairobi female sex workers almost refute any immunological genetic factor for the African pandemic. Now this claim is very strong, I do admit, because strictly speaking the infection dynamics in Nairobi female sex workers are in a position to refute genetic factors of major epidemiological significance only for Nairobi, not for the whole African pandemic. Yet the studies on Kenyan sex workers had been designed to catch major genetic factors if there are any. The phenomenon of highly exposed but persistently seronegative sex workers was certainly a good study focus for tracking down any possible or at least typical genetic influence. If there are such influences, they should prima facie have been revealed in this specific group. However, not only was no such typical solid influence discovered, but also anomalies were observed, which may even militate, which even militate against the conceptual possibility of such influences, of such genetic influences. Therefore, from an abductive standpoint, the inference from the two anomalies in Nairobi female sex workers to the ubiquitous absence of major genetic factors is moderately justified, even though by no means deductively justified or deductively valid. Now the NAA theory involves a combination of ENF, of anatomical variant and trauma, which are exactly the two options that are left. Therefore, due to eliminative induction, the etiology of the HIV-AIDS pandemic in sub-Saharan Africa is highly likely to be tied to anatomy and or trauma. Okay, now another theoretical argument. An argument from global epidemiology and anatomy against only microanatomical biological factors. I significantly improved this argument because in the original version I tried to prove that it must be the same factor in MSM and Sub-Saharan Africa, the same causal factor, but actually you cannot, you probably cannot derive this. These matters are somewhat intricate, uh, uh, but I don't think you can derive it, and so I improved this argument. I'm a scientist and scientists correct their mistakes, but uh, I think still it is a fact that the factor is exactly the same in MSM and Sub-Saharan Africans. This is simply an empirical contingent fact. Again, let us assume that behavioral and socio-economic factors are overestimated. Let us further assume that there is arguably no primary difference in the genital microstructure or microbiology between sub-Saharan African women and women with a different ethnic background, at least none of major epidemiological significance for HIV spread. Yeah, I just explained why that is so. Of course, there are secondary differences in the genital microbiology, for example, between sub-Saharan African women and women with a different ethnic background. For example, that they have more STIs or more uh, bacterial vaginosis. But this is quite probably, as I just explained, a secondary phenomenon or a secondary 
difference that stems from a more fundamental difference. And this assumption also seems rational because of the two anomalies in the infection dynamics of Nairobi female sex workers. It's quite implausible that there are microstructural differences in the vagina uh, in uh, African women, in sub-Saharan African women, uh, that would explain this infection dynamics in uh, Nairobi female sex workers. It's quite implausible. Now, let us further assume that the biological factor for the pandemic is confined to the anogenital organs, that the anogenital organs are somehow to blame or something in the anogenital organs. Because if it is not, if the factor of the, for the pandemic, if the causal biological factor for the, for the pandemic is not confined to the anogenital organs, then different or additional factors can, at least for the typical sexual transmission through simple anal or vaginal intercourse, hardly belong to anatomy or trauma to the E or F categories from above, leaving only factors from A to D, neoplasia, circulation, infection, inflammation, and genetics or biochemistry, which arguably are all implausible. If it is something beyond anogenital organs, for the typical sexual transmission through simple anal or vaginal intercourse, then an anatomical variant is excluded as a possibility. Where, where should that, maybe some, some thymus variant or some, some spleen variant that uh, changes uh, immunology, that changes immunological functions, but this is, this is quite implausible. The anatomical shape or an anatomical variant then cannot be responsible if the causal factor is something beyond, is something other than sexual organs, then anatomical variant is, is very unlikely to, to be that additional or different factor. So the same holds true for trauma. Where should the trauma be? Should they then have more traumas, more tears in the earlobes while they have sex in sub-Saharan Africa? You see, those categories then are quite are very implausible, and so for additional factors or for different factors, only factors from A to D, the first factors, are left. But they all are implausible, as the other argument showed. So if these premises are granted, well, first, it's a biological factor. Uh, second, there is no difference in the microstructure or microbiology of vaginas in sub-Saharan Africa and vaginas in other parts of the world, in other ethnicities. And three, the, f the causal factor is confined to the anogenital organs. Now, if these premises are granted, the following argument, taking the logical form of a proof by contradiction, can be made. If anal intercourse is, as is commonly assumed, a much riskier practice than vaginal intercourse, I might add this has only been found in areas with a low heterosexual burden of the disease. This common assumption or this um, theory that anal intercourse is much riskier than vaginal intercourse has only been found in places where the heterosexual burden of the, pa of the pandemic or of the epidemic is low. Now, if anal intercourse is, as is commonly assumed, a much riskier practice than vaginal intercourse, it must be so by virtue of some more fine-grained property or properties of anus rectum. Yeah, it's simply not possible, or it's not possible that vaginal intercourse per se is less risky than anal intercourse per se just because it is anal intercourse. There must be some more fine-grained property or properties of anus rectum that explains that. Let X now stand for any microanatomical property or composite of such properties of anus or rectum. For instance, gut-associated lymphoid tissue, M cells, rectal mucosa, hemorrhoidal tissue, etc. Those are properties that are specific to the rectum. M cells are the immunological cells that the rectum uses, the vagina uses other dendritic cells. Due to the 13 times higher prevalence of HIV among MSM in capital cities as compared with the general population, epidemiology outside Africa implies that the anus rectum, by virtue of at least some X, is much more susceptible to HIV transmission than the female genitalia.
Yet, given the premises, sub-Saharan African epidemiology implies that the anus rectum is just as susceptible to HIV transmission as the female genitalia, or for countries with the highest HIV rates, even less susceptible. This is a contradiction. Therefore, either no microanatomical property or composite of such properties of anus rectum is responsible for the MSM pandemic, or there are differences between the vaginas of African women and those of women with a different ethnic background other than microanatomical differences, or both. Maybe both are true. No microanatomical property of anus rectum is responsible for the MSM pandemic, and there are differences between the vaginas of African women and those of women with a different ethnic background other than microanatomical differences, for example, macroanatomical differences. Therefore, and this I can conclude from these premises, microanatomical differences alone cannot explain the HIV spread in each and every high-risk group of, uh, for, for HIV. Narrow anal genital anatomy now is a macroanatomical property which empirically happens to be similar in MSM and people of recent sub-Saharan African ethnic origin. Now, by virtue of Occam's law of parsimony, Occam's razor, this common factor seems highly likely to be intrinsically tied to HIV spread. It is only one assumption which explains all the phenomena around HIV spread. So this is quite, appears quite plausible. This theory should be preferred. Anogenital anatomical factors and Hill's criteria for causality. I already said it. Hill's criteria for causality are criteria with the help of which you can judge whether an association in science or in epidemiology is just a mere correlation or association or whether it is a cause, whether it possibly is the cause of a phenomenon in epidemiology. So I will now analyze whether NAA fulfills Hill's criteria for a causal association in epidemiology. Strength. The association is very strong in the sense that according to both direct and indirect evidence, roughly a third of those in HIV high-risk groups seem to be affected by clinically significant NAA. Why? Because there is this pumpkin seed variant in about 40% of African American women. There is anal dyspareunia, considerable anal dyspareunia, in about a third of MSM, and there are mucosal injuries in about a third of MSM and in about a third of South Africans, or a fifth to a third of South Africans who were questioned in that study. Consistency. The data presented here were gathered in various countries, on various continents, by different researchers, and all of them have yielded results pointing to narrow anogenital an anatomy through the previous decades until now. Specificity. Given that MSM are the only group of people who, due to the male anatomy, use predominantly the anus for penile penetration, and given that the vaginal shape variant, high rates of vaginal bleeding, and elevated rates of maternal death could be found specifically in persons of, sub of recent sub-Saharan African descent, sexually relevant NAA seems to occur almost exclusively in HIV high-risk groups, at least in such high proportions. Of course, narrow anal genital anatomy, narrow anal anatomy at, at least, may even be ubiquitous, but uh, non-MSM, men who don't have sex with men, don't use the anus for copulation, at least not that much. In AA, that is of sexual relevance, seems to occur almost exclusively in HIV high-risk groups, at least in such high proportions. Temporality, there is the cause should, be, should come before the effect, otherwise there could be some doubt that uh, the cause-effect relation that is supposed is correct. There is little doubt, but there is little doubt that NAA or sexual intercourse precedes sexual HIV transmission in time. Nobody would doubt that. Biological gradient. If poppers, elevated lubricant use, and anogenital bleeding are indicative of more marked NAA, 
when the dose response relationship suggests a causal role for NAA, as all these factors were associated with HIV or STI acquisition. This, by the way, is the point where STIs themselves, other STIs, fail, because they tried to prevent the STIs, they tried to tried to cure or treat STIs better, but this could not prevent new HIV infections from occurring that much. So STIs, other STIs, fail as a cause of the HIV pandemic because of the biological gradient thing, or at least they don't fulfill the biological gradient criterion. Bradford Hill clearly mentions that it is not necessary that all criteria, that all of his criteria are fulfilled for something to be a cause. Now, plausible mechanism. A narrow orifice is physically more likely to suffer more deeper or more frequent lacerations, abrasions or microscopic cracks when it is penetrated than a wide orifice. These lesions, which may occur with or without evident bleeding, may facilitate HIV transmission. And uh, this mechanism thing, this could be the point where concurrent relationships fail, because concurrent relationships alone cannot explain this higher transmission rate, this uh, enormously higher transmission rate in uh, sub-Saharan Africans. After all, we see empirically that Af sub-Saharan Africans don't have uh, so many more partners than people in other areas. Concurrency may be a little higher, but it's implausible, or it, it's, uh, this uh, higher rate of concurrency is quite implausible to explain this vast, this enormous epidemic, given the low heterosexual transmission rates that can be found in other ethnicities. So uh, this cannot explain it. Concurrent relationships fail, I think, mainly because there is no biological, no plausible biological mechanism that would explain why concurrent relationships having m several partners uh, would uh, make one susceptible to HIV so much. Now, these lesions, which may occur with or without evident bleeding, may facilitate HIV transmission. Now, coherence. There are no, as far as I know, there are no laboratory or other findings in the realm of biology di directly contradicting NAA. The studies showing that HIV crosses intact epithelium in the rectum and vagina and reaches lymphoid tissue there involved only ex vivo tissue or in vitro cellular models, not complete mammalian organisms. They do not show that seroconversion and systemic infection are possible despite mucosal integrity, let alone the usual case. The experiments on rectal HIV transmission in humanized mice are in line with NAA. They did that. They did animal experiments on HIV transmission. They transplanted human stem cells that made the mice produce human lymphocytes, and then the mice could be infected with HIV in principle, and some even could be infected, but either, either in this transmission study for HIV, either systemic infection was not possible despite adding seminal plasma and inducing colitis, or it was, but a grinding stone bit for rotary tools had to be employed in order to cause abrasion in the anus rectum. In one experiment, where systemic infection and seroconversion were possible without causing anorectal trauma, the mouse model can hardly be adequate for the human case, since X4-tropic HIV-1 infection was easier vaginally than rectally. So these results uh, on the mice actually confirm my theory very much, because either systemic infection via the rectum was not possible, or it was but a Dremel tool, a grinding stone bit for rotary tools had to be employed in order to cause abrasion in the anus rectum, otherwise the virus was not transmitted. In one experiment where systemic infection <laughs> and seroconversion were possible without causing any rectal trauma, yeah, here the mouse model can hardly be adequate because uh, X4-tropic HIV-1 was easier to transmit vaginally than rectally, which does not fit the human situation. 
high variations in HIV rates within sub-Saharan Africa, even in areas with a black majority, do not refute NAA. It is plausible that vaginal narrowness varies greatly across sub-Saharan African ethnicities. In Nigeria, for instance, the high prevalence states and the low prevalence states almost strictly reflect geographic boundaries of different ethno-linguistic groups, with the TIV being hit hardest by HIV and the Yoruba, for example, being almost spared. In fact, HLA variation studies indicate that, in sub-Saharan Africa, high ethnic diversity is consistently associated with low HIV rates, but low ethnic diversity is not necessarily associated with high HIV rates. Rwanda and Burundi, being low in both variables, were strong anomalies of this negative correlation, which at least diminishes the likelihood that low ethnic diversity or HLA variability per se is the culprit and an alloimmune vaccine the key. Indeed, contrary to earlier conjectures on some protective effect of mucosal alloimmunizations from sexual intercourse, the amount of alloimmune responses in Abidjan highly exposed but persistently seronegative female sex workers was found to be negatively correlated with the frequency of unprotected sexual intercourse. The more unprotected sexual intercourse they had, the less likely was it that they found alloimmune responses. So they thought that those ethnically diverse populations are protected against HIV because they uh, vaccinate each other in a way. They vaccinate each other in a way through sexual intercourse. They transfer those uh, immunity factors that one can uh, derive or that one can see from those HLA variations, they transfer those immunity factors uh, through sexual intercourse. But now it turned out that the more unprotected sexual intercourse those female sex workers had, the less alloimmune responses could be detected in them. But this could also be explained by a persistently wide vaginal anatomy through this regular sexual intercourse and hence fewer mucosal lesions which would otherwise enable local or systemic exchange of foreign cellular material. Then those alloimmune re reactions would take place if there were more mucosal tears, then those alloimmune responses would take place. But if there is regular intercourse, the vagina stays wide and those alloimmune responses won't occur. Uh, of course, they did find, now, they, then they did find in those Abidjan highly exposed but persistently seronegative sex workers, they did, found some, they did find some genetic factor that distinguished them from uh, Abidjan highly exposed but uh, seroconverting female sex workers. But this was only moderately significant, or this uh, genetic difference was only slightly significant, moderately significant. It was not a real hit uh, that that distinguished them, and uh, also it, it did not could not be established as a major factor or as a central factor for protection against HIV. Evolutionarily speaking, if narrow vaginal anatomy was suboptimal because it increased the chance of acquiring STIs, it should be expected to have been selected against when populations mixed and proper medical treatment was unavailable in earlier times. Those STIs could not be treated in earlier times. And so uh, life expectancy in, in deadly STIs, like, like syphilis, for example, li life expectancy went down and also the, the quality of life or the, the fertility of women went uh, down. Chlamydia reduced fertility of women. Of course, fertility is, is reduced and this is, this is the evolutionary factor. So if you have STIs, 
uh, your sexual fitness is not too high. And so it should be expected this vaginal shape variant that uh, makes STIs more likely should be expected evolutionarily to have been selected against when populations mixed and proper medical treatment was unavailable in earlier times. Then those populations or those individuals with wider vaginal anatomy had a better, a better fitness, could reproduce uh, more successfully. And this might be the reason why this marked form of vaginal narrowness is probably absent in most other ethnicities derived from prehistoric migrations from Africa. This might explain why Caucasians, why Asians don't have this vaginal, this tight vaginal shape variant that much. But why, on the other hand, maybe people uh, in uh, groups that migrated from sub-Saharan Africa very early this might explain why people in Papua New Guinea have uh, HIV rates of 1% now. This is not as high as in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but it's significantly higher than in many European countries. Now, even somewhat disconcertingly, evolution may partly explain, this is also a brutal, a, 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 a brutal truth if it is a truth, um, somewhat disconcertingly, evolution may partly explain why HIV infection numbers now tend to be stable or even decrease among high-risk heterosexual populations, but continue to be on the rise in MSM despite prevention efforts and better treatment options in both groups, because narrow vaginal anatomy might be dying out. This is a brutal fact, a cruel fact of nature. In the uh, recent... Um, Melbourne AIDS conference, people in a session actually discussed this question. How come that uh, HIV infection numbers uh, decrease in high-risk heterosexual populations? Is it the prevention? Is it the, the treatment, the antiretroviral treatment? Is it other factors? But I think it's mainly the, the most obvious thing or the most plausible explanation would be that, it's na that, it, that, that nature does its work here, that evolution does its work here. This is the most plausible answer to this question. Why should prevention methods and, and, and effective treatment, why should that not work in MSM? Why should they be more, so, so, much, so much dirtier and so much more resistant to, to prevention efforts? Or why should they be so much less adherent to treatment? This uh, actually would be, would be kind of a, a homophobic stereotype again, another one. Uh, where, wh why should there be such great differences in those two high-risk groups, heterosexual populations in sub-Saharan Africa and MSM? Why should there be so vast differences be be between those two groups? After all, they had the um, comparable developments of infection, the dynamics of the infection, are almost the same in MSM worldwide and in Sub-Saharan Africa. They reach proportions or they reach uh, fractions of, of HIV positive people of, well, 5 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30 percent of HIV positives among them. They had the same infection dynamics in the development of the, of the pandemic. But now HIV numbers or new infection numbers drop in heterosexual populations, significantly drop, but continue to be on the rise in MSM. But the prevention efforts in better treatment options, prima facie one would expect that the effect of those, of those methods would be the same. How come that they are not the same? Well, the most plausible answer is that evolutionary factors are, are at work here. Because evolutionary factors can't work in MSM, at, at least not, not that, that immediately. But evolutionary factors can work very effectively in heterosexual populations. Their evolution is much quicker. And this is another point, this is another, another uh, hint that my theory actually is the hit, is the central factor. Semi-experimental evidence, another Bradford Hill criterion. There is, a, as a, again, as I said, Bradford Hill explicitly states that it is n it, that it is not required that a causal factor fulfills all of his criteria. 
But I think that that factor which fulfills most of the criteria or even all of the criteria is a better candidate for a causal factor than factors that don't fulfill some criteria or where some criteria are not fulfilled. And for all the factors that have been put forward as an explanation of the HIV AIDS pandemic, for all of them at least one factor is not fulfilled. I said it for the STIs, I said it for concurrent relationships and almost all the other factors that are mentioned fail mainly because of coherence. They lack coherence. They lack global coherence. Circumcision lacks global coherence. Europeans are not cut. Indians are not cut, etc. CCR5 receptor mutation, it doesn't occur in Asia, but still there is not such a high pandemic in Asian countries, and so on and so on. Most of the other factors, uh, migration, mobility, uh, railways are not only present in, in Africa, gender inequality is not specific to sub-Saharan Africa, and so on and so on. Most of the other factors that are put forward for, for HIV AIDS they fail because of because of a lack of global coherence. Poverty, the same thing. I said it according to to the Oxford Poverty Index. India is poorer than countries in sub-Saharan Africa that are highly affected by HIV, and countries in Africa in sub-Saharan Africa that are poorer than India, HIV is not so bad. Now, semi-experimental evidence. There is a dearth of experimental studies on copulation in relation to narrow anogenital anatomy and mucosal lesions. This is a human taboo, but the late seroconversion of the 11 Nairobi sex workers is good semi-experimental evidence in favor of the NAA hypothesis. If NAA is the culprit, is the hit, and re-establishes itself rapidly, then these zero conversions should have been expected. And analogy, another Bradford Hill criterion, there are various analogous effects that NAA may cause, for example the disproportionate spread of other STIs among MSM and African Americans and Africans, sub people in sub-Saharan Africa or directly from sub-Saharan Africa. It would also explain the phenomenon of dry sex, it would explain the higher prevalence of bacterial vaginosis, it would explain that rife uh, secondary abstinence in sub-Saharan Africa or among blacks, and it would even could even explain the concurrency, as I said. How to test and consequences of the theory? The infection dynamics in Nairobi's sex workers and the finding that regular sex may prevent dyspareunia directly imply a way to test the hypothesis. Randomized controlled trials are needed where the intervention groups have intercourse or self-dilate their anogenital organs regularly and where the control groups continue as before. New HIV infections would be primary endpoints. Condoms and other protective measures must unconditionally be allowed for ethical reasons, just as in studies on pre-exposure prophylaxis and vaginal or anal microbicides. Yeah, people should do everything they can in order to avoid infection. And this is also done in those pre-exposure prophylaxis and vaginal or anal microbicide studies. People are allowed to use other means of protection, even those who are in the, in the control group who don't uh, get those uh, microbicides or who don't get the, the real pills that, uh, that uh, contain the antiretroviral anti drugs. Now studies should specifically focus on MSM or people of recent sub-Saharan African ethnic origin, especially given that large trials on treatment as prevention, this is a sidekick at Myron Cohen, grossly neglected these high-risk groups, making it dubious to apply their results to them. Yeah, the, those large studies or the largest, there have been some studies on, on uh, treatment as prevention in MSM or, or in, in, in black persons, that is true. But those really large studies, this big thing uh, that Myron Cohen did, those big international studies th that uh, involve uh, several countries, they grossly neglected the high risk groups. They, they, they involved mainly heterosexual people of non 
uh, Af sub-Saharan African ethnic origin. That is not 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 recent sub-Saharan ethnic and uh, sub-Saharan African ethnic origin, and so you cannot apply their results prima facie. You cannot apply their results to the high-risk groups, to people of recent sub-Saharan African ethnic origin, uh, and or to to MSM. This is uh, irresponsible almost. Alternatively, if such an endeavor is judged to be too risky given the unorthodox nature of my theory and possible harm in case it is false, I am very, very well aware of this fact or of this, of this risk, then a less interventional strategy to initially test the hypothesis would be to study the vaginal calibers in high prevalence regions of sub-Saharan Africa in the way, in the way described by Cho or Pendergrass et al., and compare them with the vaginal calibers in low prevalence regions of sub-Saharan Africa. Studying the anogenital calibers in HIV positive versus HIV negative individuals highly exposed to the virus might also clarify the role of the anogenital caliber for HIV spread retrospectively. And if these alternative studies are positive, then ethical concerns for interventions may be minimized. And in fact, in this case, ethical concerns should be raised if interventional trials are not conducted. This is pretty clear. As for the consequences of this new hypothesis in case of its empirical confirmation, its theoretical analysis in view of Hill's criteria seems to suggest that directly addressing anogenital anatomical factors in HIV prevention might amount to not less than the first causal prevention of the spread of HIV. HIV infections might thus be significantly reduced globally with few if any adverse effects and probably even with the positive side effect of eliminating anodyspareunia and colpodyspareunia in HIV high risk groups. Now uh, I'd also like to comment upon an, a reply or, uh, that I received from the NIH group, from the NIH groups working on HIV uh, prevention or on a means to, to, to stop the, the pandemic. Firstly, they said, well, there are already many prevention methods, condoms and, and so on, microbicides, pre-exposure prophylaxis, popping that pill every day, although you, you are not HIV positive yet. Um, again, I said they do, ha as I said in many other videos, they do have side effects. But now f uh, things that I didn't say yet, well, uh, I, did, I said it in some comments, but not in a, in, in a separate video in a separate video the epidemic will always come back if you only have those means if you only have those anti those antiretrovirals and so on if you treat people who are infected then if you don't catch all of the all of the all of the carriers of the virus and you won't be able to do that. You won't be able to ca to catch everyone who is HIV positive. About a third of people, or no, about a fourth, about about fourth of people who are infected don't know that they are infected, and you can't cha you can't force people to to get tested. This is also a very human thing. You can't if you obey human rights, if you respect human rights, you won't be able to do that in this way. And then if some are left who, are, who's, who carry the virus, then the epidemic will always come back if you only use treatment and microbicides and such things. At, at, but if you don't uh, prevent the causal factor, if you don't address the causal factor, if you don't uh, change that. And also these prevention methods, condoms and so on, they don't work. The epidemic is out of control in MSM. The numbers, infection numbers go down in sub-Saharan Africa, in heterosexual high-risk populations, but still new infections occur. It's not the case that they, that they will go down to zero. This cannot be expected in the, in the near future. But in MSM, the epidemic is clearly out of control. This is, this is the result of Chris Byer's work. Again, he is now the president of the International AIDS Society. So we need better methods of prevention. The other methods of prevention don't work. Condoms, etc. They don't work. 30 years recommendation of condoms and lubricants and such things, but still the epidemic is out of control in MSM, so we need better methods. The other thing, well, few if any adverse effects, I say, for those, uh, for those prevention means, dilating the anogenital organs, regularly using the anogenital organs. Well, this is what 
mo what many people or even most people regularly do at home anyway. So the adverse effects will probably not be more than adverse effects of copulation or of passing a large stool in MSM. I already reviewed the studies on the uh, continence effects of um, anal intercourse, of anal receptive intercourse, and probably or most likely there are no considerable adverse effects. See the MSM video, the ass video for this. So conclusions. For the political objections, see the separate video. I did. I made a separate video on the political objections. So see my replies to the political objections to my theory, to my theory in this separate video. So conclusions: most non-biological and biological factors which have been put forward in order to explain the HIV/AIDS pandemic. I'm sorry to say they lack plausibility. Direct and indirect empirical evidence militates for a central role of NAA in HIV high-risk groups in the key populations. Semi-theoretical arguments are in favor of NAA factors which fulfill all the Bradford Hill criteria. The theory can be tested both in non-interventional studies and in randomized controlled trials. It may significantly reduce the HIV spread again for, for the NIH comments or the, the the replies that I got from from the NIH people addressing the biological factor in MSM that would viruses reduce HIV infections in MSM by uh, 80 to 90 or even 80 to 98 percent so this clearly is the way to go any sane epidemiologist would conclude that this is the way to go. We have to address the biological factors in order to conquer this epidemic, in order to control, to finally control and maybe end the HIV spread in MSM worldwide. And finally, see my video on the political objections for that, finally, Political hurdles to the theory are either flawed or vincible.